today we're gonna run through all my settings on the Lumix S9. I have customized it quite a bit, especially some of its function buttons. The LUT button is a little bit different than the original LUT function, and also the red record button is not actually recording any video. It does have a different, I think, more useful purpose, especially for photography. My Lumix S9 settings file is available for download in the description below. So if you want to save a lot of time and load these settings straight into your camera and have it ready for hybrid shooting in just a few minutes, definitely check it out. Okay, so let's dive into the settings. First of all, we have photo styles, which is a very deep menu, it has so many photo styles you can set uh, your camera to. We have my photo styles, which is the primary function I use on the S9. There's also real-time LUT, which is the original menu when you press the LUT button. I've actually changed that, which I'll show you a little bit later, but real-time LUT basically allows you to put in a LUT, which is basically a lookup table with a color profile, right? So if you turn it on, you can see it's adjusting my image right there, and we can change different LUTs. We have, you know, we can download so many LUTs from the Lumix Lab app. Um, let's set it to teal flat S, and that's how it looks like. We can adjust the opacity. So this is a very handy slider. If the LUT is a little bit too strong, you can adjust it right there. Down here, we have contrast, highlights, shadows. Um, when I apply a LUT, I usually leave those just to the defaults. But we also have grain, and I would suggest, if you do like grain, using the low setting, Medium and standard, or standard and high, is a little bit too high for my liking. So I either have it off or on low settings. And I always turn off the color noise. And there's also sharpness and noise reduction. So I like the noise at low if I want to have like more vibe kind of shots. Um, if you want cleaner images, just turn that off. But yeah, play around with it. I think it's quite a fun function. But the thing is, if we change our LUT now to, let's say, film-like version 2 and then we go back down to the settings of grain you'll notice that the grain effect is now turned off so that's just the thing i realized that every time i change my LUT right here the noise will basically turn off and then i will have to go into the setting turn noise on and remember also to turn color noise off so the fix that i found for that is actually using my photo style and then here we can dial in a lot more settings and things that we dial in kind of stay locked into that setting. So as you can see, I have my grain set to low with color noise off, and I can actually set two LUTs, one on top of the other. So that's another bonus of using this method. So let's change our LUT from Street YC, which is my favorite LUT, by the way. Um, shout out to Emily from Microphone Nerds. But let's say we're gonna change it to Neutro and go down here. And if you look at the grain level, it is still set to low and color noise is off, which is fantastic. We don't have to worry about those settings anymore. Once we set it to low, it is constantly gonna be on. And you know, if you wanna layer and stack some LUTs, sure, I mean, doesn't that look great? But the thing is we can adjust it so we can, you know, put like 50% of this LUT and then 50% of that LUT. And you know, maybe for a specific photo that you're taking, this style might work. Now let's go back to Street YC. And another thing is each lot is built upon a specific color profile. So let's say Emily has built this lot for the Cine D picture profile, then it's based on that, but we can actually change it in here. We can change the base picture profile to be landscape, and then it's still using that LUT on top of that, which is quite cool. The real-time LUT function does not kind of allow you to do that. It's a more simplified and easy kind of a setup. So, so this option using my photo styles just gives you so much more flexibility and it's a bit more kind of reliable um, for long-term use. Just, you know, if you want to quickly change a lot and not worry about changing the grain levels. Now I'm just going to touch base on the custom buttons. Because I use my photo styles so often, I have actually reprogrammed my LUT button to bring up my photo styles. And to change my LUT, I just need to go up a few times, go into the LUT setting, press LUT button again, and now I can choose my different LUTs. But this just enables me to have that grain applied all the time, doesn't matter what LUT I am using. So the next setting I use quite a lot is the aspect ratio. So three by two is, you know, the standard for photography, but you can choose a lot of different aspect ratios. My second favorite, if not the first favorite aspect ratio is the 65 by 24. So when we go into that, this gives us a really nice wide and kind of a cinematic, you know, anamorphic like kind of an image. So if you don't have anamorphic lenses, you have some vintage lenses and you put like a Helios or like a, you know, one of these, 
Voigtlander 35 millimeters and you use this um, setting, it actually looks really good, like frames out of a film kind of a look. And especially when you combine these aspect ratios with the lots and choose the right lots for the right scene, it looks amazing. Next up, we have picture quality. So raw and fine is basically the highest quality you can get for JPEGs. And then you also have the raw files. The beauty about having raw files is, for example, if we are shooting in this aspect ratio, the 65 by 24, it is going to be, you know, like very cropped for the JPEGs, um, but the raw files actually keep the original three by two image. So you can always basically, if you put it into Lightroom, you can open up that raw image into its full form. Um, and that gives you the ability to, you know, reframe things in post if you're not exactly happy with the framing you got for that JPEG image. Um, and also, you know, you don't have the LUT applied to the raw file. So you have the full flexibility of a raw file. But in saying that, I haven't actually used raw files from the S line that much. Like pretty much most of the time, 99%. I'm just super happy with the JPEGs that came out straight out of the camera because of the real-time LUT feature, being able to apply and actually create your own LUTs as well, just makes it so usable. And um, yeah, you just get great images out of the camera straight out and you can automatically copy it to your phone. You know, it has auto transfer, which is fantastic. So that is a main feature for me. I just shoot raw just in case. Now, high resolution mode setting. I haven't really used this, but this is great if you want to create a 96 megapixel image. This is good if you're putting the camera on a tripod and getting like a landscape shot, you want all the detail. Um, this is a fantastic option. Dual native ISO, I usually leave this to auto. So if I change my ISO to 4000, like it is set now, it is automatically set to the second base ISO. Um, if you shoot at 3200, it's gonna come out with a much more grainy image. So if you're using like 1600, it's all good. And 2000, it's still okay. But if you're going anywhere above that, definitely shoot at 4000 ISO because that is the second base and just, you know, balance your exposure with the other settings. Try to um, go to 4000. So next up, we have ISO sensitivity, the lower setting is 200, the higher setting is 51,000, so this is all good. Next up, synchro scan for photo. So you can turn this off, and this is basically just to eliminate flicker. You can very precisely adjust the shutter speed. I usually leave that to off unless there's a very specific scenario with flickering lights. These few settings I just left at default. Now focus settings, if we go to autofocus, detecting subject is set to human, but now Lumix with the new update has also added train and airplane and it added two more modes into the car and motorcycle where you can actually select the target parts. So you can target the entire motorcycle or just the helmet. Same applies to the car. So you can basically target the front or the entire car. I'm gonna set it to human and between these two, eye and face just to text the eye and face, but I would always set this to eye, face and body. And that's because if you're shooting a wide shot where the camera does not detect the face, it will detect the entire human body. That's one issue with like Sony cameras. Once you get a little bit further away from the subject and you're using a wider angle lens, the autofocus will go to the background sometimes instead of the subject because it doesn't detect the subject, it just detects their face. So here with body detection, it's actually really, really good feature. I wanna focus custom settings. I do sometimes change that for video if I wanna adjust the speed, make it a little bit faster, but usually I just leave it to default um, and that's really good. But unless you're doing some really fast action paced stuff, then you can bump up the speed and the tracking sensitivity. Focus limiter and focus assist light, I turn off. Focus peaking, I usually turn on for manual lenses. So if I'm using this Voigtlander lens or the Brighton Star 28mm. The focus speaking is really handy to have. It shows you what's in focus. So when that is on, you can set the color. I usually have it to plus two, but I also have a custom settings in the quick menu mode that I'll show you very soon on how to adjust these settings quickly as well with some shortcuts. Keep going down, we have bracketing. If you wanna do like exposure bracketing for having high exposure and lower exposure shots, um, so for example, like real estate photography would be um, quite good for that. You can also do focus bracketing, which means you're taking shots with focus being set to further away and closer and closer and closer and closer. And then in post, you can combine those shots. Silent mode. I mean, this camera doesn't have mechanical shutter, so it's already very silent. But if you have some beeps and sounds coming out of it, you can turn on silent mode. I'm gonna switch back to three by two mode so we can jump into the other settings. 
And down here we have hybrid zoom photo mode. This is the setting that allows you to like use a lens like an 18 to 40 and make this an 18 to 124 or 25 millimeter. So in here, if we set this to on and we go to set it, the focal length display setting, I usually leave this to composite focal length. So it just gives you the final focal length you're using. Affect that wide angle, I leave this to on. Minimum image size. Now, this is the place where you can change how far of a reach you will have. I found that the 1.4 times crop does still look pretty good. It's a 12 megapixel photo. So if I change that to on, you can see down here we're at 40. So that would be the maximum distance we can zoom in on this particular lens. But with hybrid zoom, we can actually go past that and zoom into 56 millimeters. So now if we go into those settings and we change this to small, you'll see how much further you can get in. So extra small is even closer. And at this point, we are at 124 millimeters. So the photos at small are not as great, like still pretty good considering how much we're cropping in. But I would say medium, and if you have to go small, that's six megapixels, but I would usually go to medium and just have that little bit of extra range. So that's definitely a good feature to use if you have the 18 to 40 millimeter lens. And if you have the 28 to 200 millimeter lens, that can actually become a 28 to 624, I think. So that is a massive, ridiculous zoom that you can get with the hybrid zoom function. But if you want the highest image quality possible, then I'll turn this off. Now crop zoom for photo mode, this is very similar, but it just allows you to use your touch screen to zoom in at any point from the focal length. So it kind of works in a very similar way, but I would say the hybrid zoom is a bit more intuitive because you're just using the lens to zoom in and it basically applies a digital crop as you're zooming in. So slowly throughout the focal length, the image gets cropped more and more. All right, so image stabilization is definitely my favorite feature on the Lumix cameras. Here we have operation mode, which is just the standard one, which you probably would have most of the time on. Auto mode I found handy when doing some slow shutter photography and you're panning the camera left and right. That's when that comes handy and that's when I turn that on. Next setting is when to activate. We have half shutter or always. I had that set to half shutter just to save on battery on the S9, but we can set that to always and it'll basically have the image stabilization active the entire time the camera is on. Next up is e-stabilization only for video and this you can set to standard or high. I would usually set it to high because it's super, super stable um, and it makes the image really nice and smooth. And I just changed the camera into video mode just to show you how much the e-stabilization mode crops in. So if we go into the standard setting, it crops in a little bit and high setting does crop in a lot more, but you have fantastically like almost gimbal like moves that you can achieve with this little camera. And the only limitation about e-stabilization is that it's not good for doing any kind of parallaxing shot. So if you have a subject here and you're kind of moving around and panning at the same time, that e-stabilization will kind of have a hard time with like catching up to the subject. It will just be too much of a movement. So I would recommend turning e-stabilization off for those kind of shots. But if you're kind of like tracking left and right and going in straight lines, kind of in and out or left and right, up and down, then e-stabilization will give you amazing, amazing results. So for now, I'm going to turn that off. Now, Boost IS is a little bit different. This makes your handheld shot look more like a tripod shot. So you shouldn't use this while moving. This should only be when you're stationary, handheld, with the camera and you want to get very smooth tripod like shots and I have actually done that by using high e stabilization plus boost mode and if you have a lens that has optical image stabilization like a 70 to 200 and you enable um, e stabilization and boost mode you'll be surprised by how steady you can get those images to look like even with one hand I was able to get a pretty pretty steady shot now anamorphic stabilization is very cool because Lumix is the only brand that does image stabilization for anamorphic lenses specifically anamorphic lenses basically squeeze the image and you need to de-squeeze it in post but because of the squeeze the way that the image sensor needs to move around to stabilize the lens will be a lot different in anamorphic compared to normal spherical lenses. So Lumix has designed 
an algorithm that basically makes the image sensor work in a different way when it's with different type of anamorphic lenses. So you can choose the squeeze factor. For example, if you're using the Blazar lenses, they're 1.5x. So I'll choose this. And that way you'll have a more natural looking image stabilization. than let's say you put it on an FX3 and you try to stabilize that with just regular image stabilization, it will look very wobbly. So having anamorphic stabilization on the Lumix S9, which is such a tiny portable camera, is really, really fantastic. Now, who doesn't love free stuff, right? Especially when it's red and designed for your camera rigs. I'm super excited to announce the launch of my new brand, All Red, bringing you spicy red HDMI cables and magic arms to make your setup just as red as the shot you capture. And to celebrate, we're doing something special. Grab any item from the store and you'll get a free magic arm worth 35 US dollars to go with it. Just choose your color, toss it in your cart, and use the code EARLYRADBIRD at checkout. Hit the link down below to get started on your All Red journey. Now I'm just gonna flick back to my manual mode again for photos so we can finish up the photo menu and then go into the video functions. So after image stabilization, we have burst shot settings. Um, for fast shots, we can change this from high, medium to low. Down here, shutter delay, this could be handy if you wanna take a photo, but not have any vibration caused by pressing the shutter button. You can set that to two seconds, press the shutter, the camera will stop shaking and then it will take the photo. So that's handy for doing long exposure shots on a tripod. Time-lapse and animation, this basically allows you to make time-lapses. Um, it's a very easy menu to go through, um, but I haven't really done any time-lapses on this camera yet. Self-timer, self-explanatory, 10 seconds, press it down and it'll take one shot. We can set it to taking three shots. Now, before we move on fully into the video settings that I have preset on this camera, let's just go over the quick functions that I have set in my photos mode. Now I found there's many settings that I wanna quickly change on the Lumix S9 when outside. And because the camera doesn't really have that many function buttons on it, I have used the quick menu function to jump into a collection of the settings really quickly. So when you press the quick menu button on the front of the camera, this gives you this entire menu. Now if you wanna program the quick menu just like I did, you can jump out of this, go into the main menu and go into the setting, operational setting and quick menu settings jump down into item customized for photo. And in this way, you'll have all these settings. You can choose each one of these boxes, select it and look for the setting in the deep menu. There's so many settings you can program for the quick menu settings. So yeah, it'll take you a little while, but once you do it, I will say it's definitely, definitely worth it. It'll speed up your workflow quite a lot with this camera. Now, first thing in my quick menu is the aspect ratio. I can really easily and quickly adjust that aspect ratio just by sliding one of the dials. So yeah, it's so easy. You just press the quick button and you just slide into the aspect ratio that you want. Let's say we want a 65 by 24 and it's super, super quick. Next up we have grid lines. So I usually use the rule of thirds for composition. Um, next we have level gauge. So that just gives you a level. You can see the camera's not really level at the moment. Now it's leveled. Um, so that's just a quick thing you can turn on and off. Um, sometimes the screen just gets too cluttered. So I turn those settings off quite a bit if I just wanna see my image, but for framing certain shots, I might wanna keep those on. So that's why they're kind of all the way up top. Next up, we have my photo styles again. I can change them from here as well. Peaking sensitivity. So if I'm in manual focus, you can see my peaking right here. If that's a little bit too strong, I can adjust that down to negative two. And now it's a very subtle focus peaking. Some lenses are more sharp and they just show too much peaking. So it's good to have access to peaking sensitivity uh, very easily in a quick menu. Next, I have the crop zoom function. And the reason I have this here instead of a hybrid zoom is because when I use prime lenses, let's say a 35 millimeter, but I just want a little bit of extra reach, I can turn this on and basically just crop in my 85 or 35 millimeter prime lens. But for the most part, I leave this setting to off. Next up, it's noise reduction. I just want this to be easily accessible. Then we have grain and color noise settings. Just want that to be easily accessible as well. Then we have image stabilization. So we have normal and panning auto mode. So this is the reason why I have it. So I can quickly switch to the panning mode and do my slow shutter panning shots. Um, but I usually leave that to normal. Next up, histogram. I just like to have a histogram kind of like in the top right corner, just to see the exposure slightly. Um, because for photos, I don't really use zebras. I use zebras mostly for my video and waveforms. Um, but photography, I just use a histogram on screen. And lastly, synchro scan that just allows you to adjust the shutter more precisely. If you're getting some banding in images and low lights um, with some very cheap LEDs, they sometimes flicker too much. 
and you might get some banding. So that's what that setting is for. So it's just a collection of those settings that I might need to access quickly, but I don't want to dig for that massive menu with all those options. So yeah, having the aspect ratio is definitely the most handy thing in this quick menu for sure. And just before we jump into the video settings, I wanna go through some of the function buttons that I have set on this camera, just to make shooting easier. So the red record button that you usually use to record a video, I don't really find it handy just because it's right next to the shutter button and it does the same thing. So I have programmed the red shutter button to be my Leica monochrome mode button. So whenever I press that button, it flicks through into a black and white Leica monochrome picture profile. And the way it works is really cool because I can press it again and it jumps back to my previous photo style that I was using. So I can really quickly jump between taking color photos with a LUT to a Leica monochrome profile. And this can be applied in the menu. So if you go to function button set, settings in record mode, and change the first button, the record button, to whichever photo style you like. You might choose um, photo style one, or you can choose one of the natural vivid standards. Um, there's basically plenty of them in here. Um, so you can choose one of those as well. It doesn't have to be black and white. My next custom button is the exposure compensation button and has been changed to trigger zebras. I don't really use zebras for photos, so it's really nice to have a way to turn them on and off really quickly, but I do use them all the time for video. So when I switch to video, I just press the exposure compensation button and it triggers my zebras. As you can see, they're showing in the background where the light is a little bit too bright. Now, as you can see, my LUT button is programmed to go into the photo styles menu. And that basically gives me the ability to have all my photo styles and jump into my photo style one and have that more in-depth menu to change my LUTs. The next custom button is the AF on switch. Um, if I press that, that brings up my autofocus mode. So basically I can change that from the full area autofocus, touch tracking to zone and one area. I usually use the zone autofocus just because you can select like a rough estimate area. And if you also tap on that, you can resize it to be a bit larger or a bit smaller. So I usually find myself using the zone mode both for video and photos. Sometimes I might switch to the full area or go into the one area, let's say like it's this kind of a shot and I'm focusing on one little place. I can move the focus area around with my finger on the touch screen and focus on it. And also if you tap it and you can adjust the size if it's a smaller subject or a larger one. So that's kind of how I use that to focus. The reason why I've set the AF on button to bring up the focus menu is because this menu also allows me to punch in. So if I switch into manual focus mode, this button now acts as a very quick punch in and checking focus kind of a button. So when I use my F1.5 prime lens, the Voigtlander, it's all manual focus. So I always have to punch in and double check my focus if I am actually shooting on F1.5. It's really blurry background, so it's easy to miss your focus. Um, so that way, when it's right next to my thumb, I can quickly hit that button, check my focus and take the shot. Next up, quick menu function. This one I just left as it is, just because there's not enough function buttons here, um, like on the S5 II and the 2X. So I just leave that as a quick menu to be able to jump into a lot more settings really quickly. And down here, function button one on all my Lumix cameras across the board, I always set to peaking, and that's to turn on and off the peaking. So if I'm in manual mode and the peaking is just too distracting, I wanna turn it off for a second, I can just press that function button to turn it on and off. It's really handy for video and photo. Um, so I always program that to that function button on all my Lumix cameras, just like I programmed the exposure compensation button to be my zebras. If we keep going down, there's the digital buttons you can program. I don't really find myself using them at all uh, because I have the quick menu function set with all the settings that I need. So I don't really use this. You can program it if you like. And on page three, we have function buttons seven, eight, and nine. They're set as default. So we have ISO, white balance, and burst mode, just because these settings uh, have to be easily accessible. And that's basically, they're labeled on a camera. So that's the easiest way. But function button 10 is the one that I've changed. So originally this function would be the function that I have programmed to the AF on button. Um, but I have changed that to show um, the subject detection mode. So this brings up the detecting subjects 
its menu. So we have subject, human, animal, car, motorcycle. Um, so this is the menu that has a little bit more functionality with the latest update. So now we have train and airplane. And you know, if you go down to the parts, we can select if we want the entire airplane or have the priority over the nose of the plane. So this is a cool menu um, that's a little bit, you know, more chunky, more bigger, more options right here with that latest update. All right, now that we went through all the custom buttons for my camera, as well as the photo modes, let's jump into the video functions on the Lumix S9. First of all, exposure mode, you wanna make sure you're in manual mode, that way you can set all your settings and not have them fluctuate while you are recording. Photo styles is really important to choose the right one. If you want the most flexibility in post and you wanna edit and color grade everything, then I would recommend using Vlog Picture Profile. This is the most dynamic range and it's a really nice and easy to grade picture profile. And there's a lot of LUTs out there for Vlog specifically. So just make sure you use the right LUTs for this picture profile. Um, so if you wanna edit, definitely highly recommend Vlog. I use this most of the time um, as I mostly edit my content on the computer. But recently I found that using real-time LUTs saves quite a lot of time, especially for short stories or Instagram reels. It's just really easy to use. I just set my LUT on a camera, the picture is ready to go and I can just drop it to my phone via Wi-Fi and the new app and just straight away post it. It's graded, it looks great. It's full frame, has the bokeh, um, and it looks so much better than phone footage. So I think if you wanna post like quick content online and just copy the files straight to your phone, you can edit on CapCut and other editing programs out there on phone. It is really super easy. For photos, I use Streetway C. For indoor video, I do like the Teal Flat S LUTs. I think now there's over 100 LUTs available on the Lumix Lab app, so definitely check those out. Continuing down, we have dual native ISO. We have auto, low and high. I usually just leave this to auto. Lower limit, 100. Upper limit is auto. So all these settings are fine. Synchro scan, again, it's like, you know, if there's any images that are flickering because of like, you know, cheap LEDs, you can just control the shutter speed in one degree increments rather than like 20 at a time. These settings down here, I leave to the default now. Gain operation. This is very important. Usually this is set to seconds. Seconds is good, but if you're changing frame rates quite a bit, so shooting 25 frames and then you're shooting, let's say 50, then you wanna double your shutter, right? So every time you change to 50, you have to adjust your shutter. The benefit of using angle over just a regular shutter speed is you just need to set that once. It doesn't matter what kind of a frame rate you're using the 180 degrees will basically apply across the board. Um, and that's especially handy like with the GH7, for example, when, it, when you're doing like 100 frames per second shots, it will automatically adjust your shutter. Um, so 180 degree means if you set this camera to 50 frames, it will basically double the frame rate. So shooting at 180 degrees is a default. I usually shoot at 150, just because if I accidentally bump uh, one of the dials, I don't wanna be shooting in 240 because that's gonna look bad and have really um, too much motion blur. Next settings, I just leave to the default. So this is off. Finian and compensation is on. All these ones, I just leave as they were. Recording file format. Now this one is interesting on the S9 specifically, because we not only have MP4 and MOV, um, but we also have MP4 Lite. So this is the format if you want to record on a camera and then be able to use Lumix Lab app to copy the video footage straight from the camera into your phone. And because this file format is a lot smaller, it's quite quick to copy these files. Now, if you do switch to MP4 Lite, this just gives you one recording quality, which is 3.8K, so it's quite a decent um, resolution and 10 bit, 50 megabits per second, and this is in 25 frames. So this is a really good option because OpenGate gives you, you know, the full height of the sensor. Um, and because you have full height of the sensor, you can now put cropping markers on the sides and the top and bottom. So if you're doing vertical and horizontal videos, you can have basically more room to crop your final image. So if I wanna edit the videos on my phone, the MP4 Lite is the one I go for. Um, but if you want the highest image quality, switch it to MOV, confirm that you have a high performance PC. And now we have unlocked a lot more recording quality settings um, in the PAL region. So we have 25 and 50 frames per second. But if you're in the NTSC region, you would have the 30 and 60 frames available. 
that are highest recording quality is the open gate 3x2 6K mode. So this gives you open gate, gives you a highest resolution of 6K, which is really nice, looks really good. And this mode is also really good for anamorphic because once you de-squeeze anamorphic and it's all stretched and de-stretched, um, it basically gives you a higher frame because anamorphic are known for squeezing the image down. So if you want the highest frame, this is the mode to use for anamorphic as well. But if you're just gonna be shooting 16 by nine content, you can go 5.9K, or you can go down all the way to 4K, 25 frames per second. And this is a very common option I use as well. If I want 50 frames per second, I do use this mode right here. This will have an APS-C crop, so you'll see the image being cropped into an APS-C size sensor, which is basically making your 24 mil a 35 mil or a 35 mil a 50 mil. Next up is the My List. I haven't created one, but if you create one, you'll have all your common use options in there. Slow and quick settings, you can adjust the slow motion functions, but I usually generally just uh, do this in the record quality and I choose 50 frames if I do need slow motion. Time code, time code is handy, but probably not on this camera, like an S52X GH7. That's where you would use time code for syncing audio. Um, this camera, probably not so handy, but it's good to see that it's here. Luminance level, I just leave it to its default. Next up, we have focus mode, so we just leave it at autofocus continues. Autofocus detection settings. Now turn this on, and this will allow you to have the human, animal, and that sort of detection settings. This is all very same as the photo modes. Autofocus custom settings. I usually have these set to default, but if I do want a little bit of a more snappy or a faster autofocus, if there's like more movement involved, um, I can basically bring this up to maybe plus three and plus two. Um, but other than that, I usually keep it to the default. If you're filming like yourself and it's not really a moving shot and you're just filming your face, I wouldn't change that to be too fast because then it might start hunting a little bit. So just change that depending on the scenario. If you're filming something really fast, do change that. You can bring it up slightly, but otherwise the default settings work really well. Focus limiter, you can set limits on your focus points. Continuous autofocus mode two is always the best because it just has autofocus working all the time. Autofocus assist light, nope. Uh, focus speaking, same as on the photos mode. We just have that on plus two. And you know, when we switch out to manual focus, peaking shows up. And if it doesn't, we have that custom button to turn that on. Focus frame moving speed, fast is good. Uh, sound record level display, I do have that on. So when the level display is set to large, it just takes too much space on screen. So I usually like to set that to small, but I still like to have that visible on screen. So when I do some videos, I can see that my mic is actually working because this camera unfortunately does not have any headphone jacks. So I do need to monitor the audio that way. Mute sound input off. Sound recording gain level is set to standard. If you have a really loud mic, you can basically lower this down. But I just found that um, setting the record level adjustment to negative 10, is what usually works quite well for me and uh, it just stops anything like clipping too bad. Um, and also my microphone that I usually use, the Hollyland Lark Max, has the ability to record two channels. So if I use one microphone like this, uh, the left channel is a bit quieter than the right channel. That way, if I do speak really loud, I can use the safety track and um, have non-clipped audio. Sound quality, 48 kilohertz. 24 bits. Sound recording level limiter, I keep that on. No wind reduction and the mic socket. And mic socket is set to plug and power. That means the camera will supply some power to the external mic. So if I'm using like a small little video micro mic, then um, that can get the power from the camera automatically. Continuing on, silent mode, that's self-explanatory. And then we jump in to the image stabilization, which we already basically covered. Self timer, focus transition, segmented file recording, live cropping, all that stuff you don't really need. So let's jump into the next menu item, photo style settings. Uh, this just allows you to hide and show photo styles. LUT library, this shows you the entire LUT library. So I have quite a lot of LUTs. I think I filled out the entire camera with the LUTs. Um, there's quite a lot of good ones on the Lumix Lab app, which you can download and basically just transfer it straight to the camera. ISO increments using one third, uh, that gives you just a little bit more control. Extended ISO on, yeah, that's important. If you just wanna push your ISO really high for some reason, you can do that. 
And down here, all these settings I basically just leave as default. But the creative video combined set is super important, especially if you do a lot of hybrid shooting. So if you want to keep your settings separate from your video profiles and photo profiles, you can actually set this up over here. So anything that has the video camera icon will be separate from the photo mode. So I can have my videos to always be in vlog and my photos to always have my LUTs already applied. The same thing happens to metering mode, autofocus mode, as well as my f-stop shutter speed and ISO. So I can have my shutter speed really high for photos, but for video it's going to be 180 degrees with the f-stop wide open. The only setting I keep consistent for photo and video is my white balance. So if I quickly want to change from my photo to take a quick video, my white balance will be still set to the same value. Next up we have focus settings. The first three I have just left as default. The next one is autofocus and manual focus at the same time. That means when your lens is switched to auto, you can still touch your manual focus and basically trigger the camera to go to like the background or come to the foreground. So if the autofocus for some reason didn't pick up on a subject, you can just basically just trigger it with that manual focus and it'll catch on to that subject. So don't really use that often, but it's good to have on just in case. Manual focus assist, uh, I usually turn this feature off. I think it is on by default. It's just when you go to manual focus, when you turn the focus wheel, it will actually punch in and zoom in automatically. I find that this is a little bit annoying. So I just prefer to have that programmed to my button right next to my thumb so I can manually punch in. I haven't changed any of these settings. The next one is human eye detection display. This will basically have a little um, square around the eye. So I think that's quite handy to have. So you can definitely see that you're getting the eye in focus. Half press shutter means when you half press the shutter, it will take a shot. So this setting also stays off. Assign record to shutter button. That means you can use the shutter button as a record button for video. And then you can use the actual red record button as something else as I do for the Leica monochrome picture profile for my photos. We can keep going down onto the quick menu settings. And this is the menu that we've set before. So if we go for photo, we can set these quick menu items from this menu here. If you wanna set up your video quick menus, it's here as well. Next up is function button set. So we also went over this with all the custom buttons. Dial set, I don't think I've changed this. If it isn't the default, then uh, let me know. Next up, we have constant preview. So this just allows you to have a preview when you're doing photos. So you don't end up with uh, a very bright looking screen. And when you take a photo, it's actually really dark or the other way around. Um, so I set this to on and in the effects panel, it's A mode, no effect, M mode, aperture, shutter speed. Histogram is on, but I usually turn that off for video and turn on the waveforms. Photo grid line, again, if you need it, that's there. Live view boost, I haven't really used. Night mode, night mode is cool. If you're doing some night stuff, it just turns your monitor into like a very rad and more eye-friendly at night sort of an image. So that's handy for some things. Monitor display settings. I think this is the default as well. We can keep going down. The next important setting is level gauge. I sometimes use this to just show a level, um, but that's also in my quick settings. So I don't really dig through this menu too often. Next up, framing outline. Sometimes it's handy if you're doing like a night shoot and you can see there's an outline now showing up around the edge of the frame. Because the monitor here is just black, it sometimes might be a little bit hard to see where the edge of the frame is when you're filming in a dark environment. Log view assist, if I change my picture profile to vlog, now we can go into the log view assist and change the LUTs, the preview LUTs that we are using. So these LUTs are not baked in at all. So the footage will basically look like this. It's very flat. So this is just a preview light so you can see the image correctly, how it's gonna be graded later, and also to expose the image correctly. So you can change these lights, but without affecting the final vlog image. Sometimes external monitors have their own LUTs built in, so you could turn this off for the HDMI and just have LUT applied on the monitor itself. HLG, I don't really use, so we're gonna skip on this one. Anamorphic de-squeeze display, so anamorphic lenses squeeze your image, so this just allows you to see the final de-squeezed image, which is really handy. You won't see what this is doing at the moment because this only affects the built-in monitor and not the external HDMI display. Monochrome live view just allows you to preview your monitor in black and white. Center marker, I always find the small one is good. Safety zone off. Next up we have frame marker. Now what this allows you to do is turn on multiple frame guides and you have so many to choose from, different colors. You can position them in different places. So let's say our final deliverable for a video is nine by 16. 
which is here, and also 235, which is like a more horizontal long aspect ratio. So if we're doing both, now we can have preview of both aspect ratios and make sure our framing is correct. We can also tap on the screen and move these ones around. So let's say we wanna frame this area for the vertical video, but for the horizontal video, we want that framing to be a little bit lower. So this is not going to affect your final image, but what this does allow you to do is make sure that what you're framing is actually within your frame, or you know this might make you go a little bit wider just to get both things in frame. And this is also where OpenGate comes into play because now we're in a 16 by nine aspect ratio. If we switch this to OpenGate, you see how we jump out and we have more top and bottom information there. So this gives you some more uh, vertical space for that vertical Real. And then here we also can change the frame mask. Now the frame mask basically makes any area outside of the masks darker. So I've set that to 75%, so I can still see a little bit of it. If you turn this off completely, basically you can see the entire image. But if you wanna focus more on your framing, I would say setting that to 75 or 50 is pretty good. And live view frame adjustment allows you to move the masks on the screen and also resize them. Going down, we have zebra patterns. So we can turn on zebra one, zebra two, or both at the same time. I usually just use zebra one and I set that to 80%. That just shows me the clipping point when using the vlog picture profile. And as you remember, I have programmed my zebras to the exposure compensation button. So now that is showing up in vlog. So that means that light in the background there is slightly overexposed. So if I wanna expose for the lights, I can bring my exposure down and this would be basically just below clipping. Waveforms and vector scopes are super handy. It shows you the exposure of the image from left to right. If something's clipping on the right, you'll see that on the waveform. Unfortunately, I cannot show you this because the waveforms are only showing up on the small monitor right here, but you can kind of see it. You can make this bigger or smaller. Next really important setting is the red record frame indicator that just puts a border around the entire image, making sure and showing you that you are actually recording. It's so much easier to see this than um, just a tiny little record uh, dot in the left bottom corner. Next up, we have HDMI record output. Info display basically allows me to have all the menus uh, like you see it right now. So the menus show up on top of the image. Um, if we turn this off, basically everything is gone. Now it's a clean image, clean signal. Um, but I really wouldn't worry about these settings too much because the S9 has a micro HDMI cable, which is really not that sturdy and its placement is, yeah, I'd say it's pretty horrible because it is on the grip. So uh, I don't know how you would use an HDMI monitor while having it plugged in and trying to handhold it. Maybe if you build this up into a bigger rig, but then it kind of kills the purpose. So I would say 40 Lumix S9, you wouldn't really use HDMI uh, monitors, just use the built-in camera monitor. And for the bigger cameras like the S52, S52X, this setting is pretty important. Next up, lens focus resume. So if you restart your camera, this kind of goes back into the same focus. So that's good just to have on. Next important setting is focus ring control. This is set to linear, which makes the focus feel a bit more natural. And also on Lumix native lenses, you can set the focus throw of the manual focus. So you can make this 360, which means it will take a longer throw of the manual focus ring. Currently I have the 18 to 40 millimeter lens set to 300 degrees, but you can make that even smaller. So it's a lot faster to snap from infinity to close focus. Next up, vertical position info for the video. I always have this to on, so if I rotate the camera vertically, then uh, the video files actually have this built into the metadata that there are actually vertical video clips rather than horizontal. All right, if you guys made it that far into the video, congrats, we're almost there. All right, so next we have card format, self-explanatory, if you wanna format the card, you can do that here. Folder file settings, uh, you can customize your folders and files the way they are named. Power save mode, on the S9, I keep this to one minute just because I wanna save on a battery if I just leave this camera lying around somewhere or clip it on my belt. Um, I just want this to turn off real quickly. So I set this to one minute, but on my other cameras like the S5 II, I would set this to five, 10 minutes or even sometimes to off. So the camera never turns off if I'm in a studio setting running off a V-mount battery. Video recording limits. Now this is one of the things that Lumix has updated, which is fantastic. It used to be on and then, you know, in 6K, Open gate, you would have 10 minutes record limit. Uh, I think it was 15 minutes in 4K, but now you can turn this off. Um, the camera will warn you that it will get hot. So I would recommend 
opening up the uh, the flippy screen just to give the camera a little bit more breathing room, but this will pretty much unlock the camera for you. So it's really great to see that they added this function to unlock the camera. Um, so if you are in a colder country or in a colder environment, you'll be able to record for way longer than you were before. Monitor frame rate, 30 frames, that just saves a little bit on the battery. Monitor settings, uh, I leave these as default, but monitor backlight, uh, I usually have this set on all my cameras to plus three. And the battery on the Lumix S9, even when I have this monitor set to plus three, is really good, especially with that one minute kind of auto turn off if I'm not using the camera mode. But if I need to use it, I just half press the shutter, it will turn on really quickly and I can just continue shooting. So having a monitor backlight to plus three is really important, especially that this camera doesn't have an electronic viewfinder. So the monitor is the only way you can see your photos and your framing. So plus three is the way to go. Next one is beep. Um, I have turned beeps off, but uh, the shutter volume, the shutter tone, I have turned to on just because this camera doesn't have a mechanical shutter, only an electronic one. So I do want some kind of a feedback that I actually took a photo um, so that's why this setting is on and I would recommend it unless uh, you're in like a quiet environment. Wi-Fi and Bluetooth, very good features on this camera. The new lab app is a lot better than the previous sync app. So you can pair it really easily by going to pairing at a new device and you'll have the instructions on your phone once you download the lab app. So it's super simple. You can also send images straight to your phone from the camera, which is a new feature they added in the latest update. Um, there's also the auto transfer. You can turn this on basically once you pair this camera to your phone and you can just put your phone into your pocket and just keep taking photos and the camera will send those photos automatically into the app and they will show up in your camera roll without you having to you know, select the photos and send them manually. So as you're taking them, they're already getting loaded into your camera roll, which is super, super handy. Location logging, I do have this on because sometimes I wanna log my locations with the GPS signal from my phone so they get synced to this camera. And then you also have the old sync app settings so you can do remote wake up and other things like that. Scrolling down here is nothing too important. Um, safe to custom mode. Uh, these are custom modes, which I haven't actually personalized because I have so many of the custom buttons set already and I don't find that I will need to have a specific custom mode. But you can set a preset of all your photo modes or your video modes and have that baked into like a custom one or custom two or three on the physical dial on the camera. Down here we have save and restore camera settings. So if you wanna use my settings and everything I have set up here today without actually setting it up, you can just go into load and load up my camera settings once you put it onto the SD card of the camera. And down here we have system frequency. So that's something you just wanna adjust if you're in, for example, America, that will be NTSC. If you're in Europe or New Zealand, Australia, that'll be PAL, 50 Hertz. And cinema, if you wanna shoot like native 24 frames, not. 29.8, no, 29.98, um, then you would choose the cinema mode. Pixel refresh is good to do every once in a while, so if you have some kind of a stuck pixel, this would usually remove that. Sensor cleaning also, you can do that once in a while, or just shake the sensor and get rid of any dust that might be on it. And down here, firmware version, this is where you can update your firmware of the camera. And last but not least, we have my favorite settings menu. So this is all the settings that I usually use quite often. So there's three pages of them and feel free to basically copy them if you want to. It's all the things that we went through the big menu, but they're just put in here so I can have easy and quick access to them. So there's things like photo styles, recording file format, quality, frame markers, the outline, uh, waveforms and things like that. So that's all the important settings that I always need to quickly access. Now there's one more setting that we didn't cover and that is raw processing. It allows you to process the raw photos that you already took and apply a different LUT, some grain, and just basically change the white balance and a lot of different features. So it's kind of like editing your photos after you take them on the camera itself. So unfortunately that feature doesn't work with the HDMI plugged in, so I'll just record this separately. If we go into here, we can select my latest photo. Let's select that. And down here we can adjust the white balance, brightness correction, the photo style, um, dynamic range, contrast, highlights, shadows, saturation, hue, the grain effect. So we can, like, if we don't like the grain, we can just get rid of the grain and create a new JPEG image without the grain. We can turn off the color noise, do noise reduction, sharpness, and also apply LUTs and their intensity. So let's say I took a photo, don't like that LUT anymore, jokes, I do, but neutral, 
let's say that. And now we've changed that. We can change the opacity um, and we can create a new JPEG file from that raw image, save as a new picture. And now we have this photo as well as the original JPEG. So now we can have two and you can create as many as you want and edit all your raw photos that you want to change here. So thanks for watching. I hope you found this video helpful. If you have any further questions after that massive long video, do let me know down in the comments below. And I'll see you guys next time.